which means you know all events, all four events in gymnastics, um, the floor, the beam, the vault and the bars. But they needed her final vault to make the gold to beat the Russians who they'd never beaten before. So she destroyed her ankle to make that vault which meant she couldn't do her personal all around. She gave up her dream of personal gold for the team. It's a powerful image. I, I still remember that, um, that time. I was just very young when I saw it. But her driving ambition since she was five was to be an Olympic gymnast. And uh, that ambition was so powerful in her that she was willing even to destroy her own dream to win for the team. And uh, tonight I want to look at the disciples' ambition. And ambition is kind of this ugly word which we, we think about in a negative concept. But when you look at Carrie's life there, you see that her ambition was to win gold, but her overriding ambition was to win for the team, even if that meant she gave up her own dream of personal gold and uh, there is a good ambition a noble ambition and the disciples should have ambition and we're going to talk about that ambition tonight let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 9 so we make it our goal or it can be translated our ambition to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it so Paul is saying here that his ambition was to please God in everything he did. And God calls the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. We talked about that this morning, right? God calls the morons to confound the wise. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but he's not calling us to stay morons. He's not calling us to stay foolish. He does not want us to be content with a lackluster life where bland mediocrity is the currency of our life. He wants us to burn for him. Just like Kerry burned for her team. You know, didn't matter. She was going to destroy her personal dream for gold, but she burned for the team. Her ambition was to see that her team could win something that had never been won before by the USA team, even if it meant giving up her personal dream. Many fail to achieve anything significant for God or man because they lack a dominating ambition. No great task was ever achieved without the complete abandonment to it that a worthy ambition inspires. You could truly say that Kerry was completely abandoned to that task. She had trained, she had given her life since she was five to win that medal and yet she still gave it up for the team. Yes, she did win a medal, a team medal, but it's different when you win a team medal versus that personal goal. And so her ambition was a driving, complete abandonment to achieve that goal, and yet she was still willing to give it up for the team. And I wonder, in these years of COVID, this year of COVID, if we understand how it has actually affected the Olympics. You know, this was supposed to be an Olympic year, and they have moved the Olympics till next year. And as I was um, listening to them talk about this, it actually is a huge factor in an Olympian, uh, the, the timing of every event. They actually time their training, their equipping, their, their diet, their exercise, the performance all around this four-year timetable. And of course, they have the, the World Championships, they have all these other events. And so everything is timed down right to the week when they're going to actually perform. And suddenly, it's a year away. Everything is put out, all their training, all their, their, their pre preparedness has changed because the Olympics is no longer on the date that they expected it to be. And, uh, you know, Olympians have this dominating ambition to be their best. You know, they don't care what it means. They will get up at whatever time in the morning, however cold it is, however hot it is, they will train, 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 train. And, you know, like uh, 
this extra year has meant even more training and equipping for them. And then the next set of Olympiads will have one year less to prepare for the Olympics. And so, you know, everything has been kind of tipped upside down, but they are still willing to perform because their ambition, their driving ambition is to be the best. And so even though everything is mucked up and messed around, they're still going to try and be the best that they can be. You know, marathon runners trade a year of their life for every marathon they run. They actually trade a year of expect, life expectancy for every marathon they run. That is the dedication and commitment to their trade. That when they run a marathon, they're basically giving up a year of their life expectancy. That is how much they put into a marathon. It is 42 kilometers or miles. Anyone know? I think it's kilometers. They run it in about two hours. It's insane. They're literally running at 20 kilometers an hour. It is very, very fast. Um, yeah, it is very, very fast. They have a hunger and ambition to be the best. And they trade even some of their life to be that best. I remember when I was young and um, someone came up to me, a, a person, an older person, and they said to me, in a, a derogatory way, they said, Chris, you are ambitious. And they were saying it in a way to put me down. And um, I kind of felt a bit hurt by that because I, I, I respected this person. And I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe I am like ambitious in the wrong way. And I went to the Lord and sought his heart about it. And he said, Chris, no, you're ambitious for me. You're not ambitious for you. You're ambitious for me. And I honor that in you and I love that in you. And don't let what others say about you worry you because they're embarrassed by their own lack of ambition for me. And Paul here outlines another ambition, one that is not driven by self-desire to achieve for self, but one that is a noble ambition, one of a life given over to please the Father. Do we have a driving ambition that gets us up early to pray, that drives us to live a life given totally in service to our King? You see, what these Olympiads have is a driving ambition to achieve gold. But we are told in Hebrews to run this race, right? To finish this race, to run toward the goal. But our driving ambition is often to the couch or to our bed or to the you know, social media rather than to the prayer or to reading the word or to spending time in worship or even to just being here tonight. Praise God, you're here, but this place should be full. You know, like our driving ambition is really for ourselves. You know, it's about looking after numero uno, number one. You know, me, what do I want? What do I need? What, what's going to make me feel good about myself? You know, it's, we don't have this driving ambition because we've been taught that ambition is bad. It's pride. Don't, don't get into ambition. Don't touch it. But ambition for God's glory is not bad. And Paul says this here. My ambition is to please him. That's what Paul said. His ambition was to please God. And we need a driving ambition in our life. We function better when we have something that drives us in the morning, in the evening, throughout the day. The issue with ambition lies in the motivation. Is it for us and our glory or for the glory of Jesus? Some people even, you know, come to all the prayer meetings and come to all the meetings because their ambition is to seek glory for themselves, to look good in front of others. So their motivation for what they're doing is not for the glory of Jesus, it's for the glory of themselves. And so we always have to check our motivation. Is it for Jesus or for us? And too many disciples are content with the status quo. You know, this kind of grace stuff has taught us to be people of low self-achievement. Well, you know, I don't really need to improve myself in my walk with God because I'm under grace. I can just fail and it's okay, you know, because I'm under grace. And so we've developed this kind of thinking where mediocrity is okay because I'm under grace. 
And that's not what God's heart is for his people. That's not what God's heart was when he spoke through Jesus and said, be you perfect as I am perfect. You know, there should be a driving ambition in us to improve ourselves before the Lord, not in our own strength, but with the Holy Spirit's empowerment in our life, desiring and hungering for God to, to do a work in our heart that we become all that he's called us to be. An ambition to further the glory of Jesus on this earth. God wants people with that dominant ambition in their heart that they will do anything, go anywhere for his glory to be made manifest and for people that have never even heard about Jesus to hear about him. And that's his desire for all of us. And that's not a bad ambition. It's actually an ambition that God is calling us all to. And it's an ambition that glorifies Jesus. And we talked about that this morning, you know, that our lives for, for, to be this conduit that the Holy Spirit will work through must have this ambition to glorify Jesus. That must be our heart and our passion. And so we're going to look at the test of ambition in our life, you know, the motivation of our ambition. And let's go to Mark 10, 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said... We want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> Jesus, here's a blank check. Can you sign it for us, please? <laughs> what do you want me to do for you? Jesus wisely asked. <laughs> they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Wow. There was certainly no um, hanging back in their request. <laughs> You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? You know what Jesus was asking them? Are you willing to suffer what I'm going to suffer? And they said, we can. Yeah, I can do it for that. You know, if I can sit at your left or your right, I don't care. Yeah, I can suffer. Jesus said to them, well, you are going to drink the cup I'm going to drink. You are going to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. <clears throat> These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. <laughs> when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus here is talking about ambition. And he's He's not saying that ambition is wrong. He's saying, what's the motivation behind your ambition? Because if you want to be great, if that's the ambition you're seeking, then the way is to serve. So James and John were both ambitious and even declared that they were ready to suffer with Jesus. But their ambition was motivated by a self-centered priority to have the place of glory in heaven. The kingdom of God is founded on self-sacrifice, not on selfishness. Think about it like this. James and John were asking for a crown of glory. Jesus chose a crown of thorns. They wanted to rule over their friends and peers. Jesus told them that the road to greatness was by serving, not by ruling. And I want to go deeper into this because I think that we haven't really understood this concept of serve. Let's go to Luke 17, 1 to 10. This is one of those scriptures where you kind of want to erase it out of your Bible because you think, did Jesus really say that? Is that really true? Jesus said to his disciples, Luke 17, 1 to 10, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. 
And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Because, you know, they, they, they all had this thing going on where they wanted to be the greatest. I mean, it wasn't just James and John. Even at the Last Supper, when Jesus is about to go to the cross, we are told that they were arguing about who was the greatest. And they're just thinking about, forgive Judas, forgive Peter, forgive John, you know, forgive James. You know, they're thinking about the things that are being done that they have to forgive. And they go, increase our faith. We can't even do that seven times. Remember, Peter came to Jesus. How many times must I do it? Seventy times seven. <laughs> it's like they thought they needed this huge faith to be able to forgive. And, and then Jesus just goes, you know, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and plant it in the sea and it will obey you. So Jesus is saying, guys, it's not an issue of faith. Okay, because you just need this tiny little faith and it's going to happen, right? There's actually something deeper that's going on in your hearts. There's a pride in your hearts and this is what it is. And he, he outlines it. He says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you are told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Wow. No one thanks me. No one ever appreciates me. I'm offended. We were watching the story of Rick Renner's life last night and uh, he tells the story of how he came under the ministry of a great man of God and this man of God woke up and, and spoke to Rick every morning at 5.30 in the morning, spent an hour with him each morning and just sowed into his life. Uh, raised him up in ministry in his church. He was married to his wife in the church and, and uh, they began to serve as pastors in that church. And one day this pastor who had taken Rick under his wing said, Rick, you have pride, pride in what you're achieving. And, uh, you know, that's not good. And so Rick got offended and he left and he started another church and took some of the people of this man with him and... Um, Rick shares that this was his Ishmael church. He, he planted it and it wasn't what God asked him to do. And, and God actually corrected him and said, I didn't ask you to do this and I can't bless you in this because it's not what I asked you to do. And so he went back to his pastor and he, he repented and asked forgiveness for what he'd done to him. And he supported his ministry ever since until that, that man died. And, uh, you know, they became very, very close friends. And that man even came and preached in Rick's church in Russia. And, you know, it's a beautiful story about this thing. But you see, Rick was looking for praise and glory. And when his, 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 his pastor said to him, hey, you're in pride, he rebelled against it. And Jesus is saying, here, you don't need more faith, guys. You need more serve. You need more serve. And in the kingdom, our ambition... Yes, is to please him and we please him through our service. Not through our grand achievements, but through our service one to another and in serving him. And Jesus is saying, what counts at the end of the day is me coming here on earth as your Lord and Master to serve you. That's what I did. And you should also serve as I have served you. And that's that famous passage in John where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And we, we talked about the disciple servanthood last week. If you, if you didn't catch that, please watch that on YouTube and, 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 and see that because it was important to lead up to this. But you know, there's this, this understanding, this test of ambition. In my ambition for the kingdom of God, am I willing to serve? Am I even willing to serve those who offend me and hurt me? Am I willing to serve those who have even done wrong to me in my opinion? Maybe they didn't do wrong to you and you just thought they did. But, you know, Jesus served John, the disciple he loved, and he served Judas, the disciple that betrayed him. He served them equally and he loved them equally. And so we need to understand that the test of our ambition is the test of service. Because when we serve, we truly are 
submitted to his kingdom. The kingdom of God is founded on sacrifice, sorry, selflessness. And the road to greatness is by serving, not ruling. You don't need more faith, you need more serve. Count Nicholas Zinzendorf founded the Moravian Church. His ambition was enshrined in these words, I have one passion. It is he, he alone. And obviously he was speaking to Jesus about that. The Moravian Church pioneered a mission movement when the rest of the Protestant Church was competing with the Catholics to build the biggest cathedrals. And you look at those cathedrals now, they're just tourist monuments where people go and visit. They're not thriving churches, they're just tourist monuments. They have no passion about them, just a a feeling of what was happening here, what happened, why is this place so empty? I've walked in some of those cathedrals and thought, oh, so empty, why? And in the middle of this cathedral competition, Zinzendorf, with a bunch of refugees, started a 24-7 prayer movement, unbroken for over a hundred years. Never once did they stop praying, 24-7 for over a hundred years. What that required was generational passing on of prayer. You know, grandparents to parents to children, because you don't have Someone who's zero praying to a hundred, you know. It was a generational movement and it sent out hundreds and hundreds of missionaries. And, you know, when you were a missionary at that time, it was a death sentence. You know, the average lifespan of a missionary was two years. You either died because someone on the mission field killed you or you died of a tropical disease or you, you just, <laughs> whatever it was, you died of something and the average lifespan of a missionary going out was two years. There was one moment in their, their mission movement when many of them died and uh, they, they, they spoke about these people dying and they said, we need someone to go and replace them. And I think it was uh, maybe 19 people that had died and 19 new people stepped forward and said, we're ready to go. And you know, it was just this commitment, you know, this driving ambition, my life is for him. And so this movement drove a hundred plus year prayer movement. You know that Wesley was actually inspired by Moravians when he came back from America? It was actually the Moravians that inspired him not to give up. And he founded his movement from that moment in a storm when his ship was almost wrecked. And he saw two Moravians praying on that ship and not afraid. And he saw their faith praying. You know What Moravians did, they prayed. Very, very powerful story of how Wesley was touched and... Um, Obviously, he and his brother went on to do a mighty work of God, even greater than the work of the Moravians. And uh, it came through their inspiration of what they saw in these Moravians. And um, his was a worthy ambition that's found its center in Christ and reached the world. You know, they sent missionaries to the Eskimos. They were the first people ever to reach out to Eskimos. You know, like, could you think of a a colder, more difficult place to go (laughs) as a missionary than to Eskimos? I mean, like, right up in the ice and, you know, no other people ever having gone there before. A very, very difficult task. We can test our own ambition with this measuring stick. Will the fulfillment of my ambition bring glory to God and make me more useful to him in reaching out to a lost world i'll say that again will the fulfillment of my ambition bring glory to god and make me more useful to him in reaching out to a lost world henry martin who was a brilliant scholar and a missionary expressed his master ambition in these words i desire not to burn out for avarice to burn out for ambition, to burn out for self, but looking up to that great burnt offering to burn out for God and his world. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul has this to say, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And I wonder, does Christ's love compel us in our ambition? And I want us to have a discussion break now. And I want us to just talk about Christ's love. And does that compel us, you know, in what we do? Does it compel us when we wake up? Does it compel us during the day? Does it compel us at night? Does it compel us in our rest? 
does Christ's love compel us? Because we've all died. That's what Paul's saying. What does that mean? We've died to the things of this world that have compelled us. And now it's Christ's love that compels us. And I want you to just have a discussion around that on the tables. What would that actually look like, Christ's love compelling me each day? What would it look like in my prayer life, in my, my Bible reading, in my witness, in my workplace, in, in um, my relationships with family, in my attitudes? What would it look like with Christ's love compelling me? And ask ourselves, does Christ's love truly compel me? Or do I need to make some adjustments there? Do I need to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and make a change in my life? So let's have a discussion around that and then we'll come back and finish the study. I think um, part of the challenge is that when we have an ambition for God's glory, the devil can come and speak to us and say, oh, you're arrogant, or you're full of pride, or you're just wanting to show off. And, you know, we have to be aware of our motivations and be able to stamp our foot on the devil and go, no, I just want Jesus to be glorified and my life is to live for him. And we have to know our heart and, and, and just each day examine our heart before the Lord and say, God, just show me if my motivations are wrong today, you know, am I doing this because I'm trying to perform for you? You know, because that is a wrong ambition because Jesus performed it all on the cross. Or am I doing this because I just want your glory in my life and in this world and, and that's what I'm living for? So asking ourselves those questions is important. I think my wife is... And that's the true disciple maker, one who walks that journey. And that's what we're talking about tonight, right? Discipleship and how we make disciples and walking that journey with them. So that's, that's really good. Um, <clears throat> I just want to um, finish tonight with a story of a man um, who truly, I guess you could say, inspired me as a young person and gave me an understanding of healthy ambition and what ambition looks like in a person that wants to live for Jesus. But I just, I just want to begin with Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy, there's that bucket of joy <laughs> set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was just saying something to me right there that, you know, Remember I was talking about happiness and joy and the pursuit of happiness this morning and it's not about happiness, it's about joy. And we see here the cross. There was nothing happy about the cross. There was nothing happy about being nailed to that cross. You know, There was nothing about pursuing happiness in that place. But it was the joy that gave Christ the strength, the joy set, you know, of those before that were going to come into the kingdom because of what he was going to do. So his bucket of joy was not the suffering it was the strength the Lord gave him knowing what was going to happen through that suffering. And so joy is not something we get because we're having this great experience. It's, a, it's, it's from God, the joy of the Lord. You know, God's joy is our strength. And um, it's a beautiful illustration of that joy here when we are struggling with something to understand that that bucket of joy is not some kind of happy experience. It's God's strength in our life. And um, yeah, so... Anyway, I want to talk about Jim Elliott. Who, who's heard of Jim Elliott here before? Okay, about half of us. Jim grew up a very talented young man. He was good looking, a great speaker and sports person. He loved the outdoors and was passionate for God. But God began to do a work in his heart, challenging him to go beyond the shores of his native USA and reach out to people who had never heard the words, Jesus Christ. A people, as people began to question his talk of missions as something best left for others, that his skills and abilities would be of best use challenging the youth of America. So basically they're saying, man, let someone else go, Jim. You're too talented and you've got too many skills and too much that's great about you that you need to inspire and challenge the youth of the USA. Don't go. You'd be a waste. You know, let someone else go. And he said, we are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace, while we profess to know a power 
the 20th century doesn't reckon with. But we are harmless and therefore unharmed. He means the devil. You know, we're harmless to the devil and therefore we are unharmed. We are spiritual pacifists, non militants, uh, <coughs> conscientious objectors in the battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Wow. Conscientious objectors in this battle against spiritual. Sorry, God, I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. I'm a conscientious objector. You know, I, I'm conscientious, God. I love you, but I'm not going to fight. We are sideliners coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. The world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. Wow. Wow. So you can feel the ambition in him. You know, it's a burning for Jesus. And he doesn't care that everyone around him is telling him, stay home, Jim. You're a valuable asset. You need to challenge the young people of the USA. You know, they were challenging him with a vision that was positive. You know, you can inspire these people. But he was not sidetracked because his ambition was to glorify Jesus. And so in that point, he goes, I'm not going to be a conscientious objector. I'm not going to get out of this fight. I'm in, you know. I'm not going to be this spiritual pacifist that doesn't combat the enemies of darkness, you know, and leave that to someone else. Am I willing to fight or am I willing to wait? Wait for a better time, an easier time, a more successful time, a time when I have more time. <laughs> no, the time is now. Faith is now, not tomorrow. Oh, how many people have lost their purpose in God because they waited for a tomorrow that never came. What's our ambition? What is driving us? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Sorry, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And someone's kind of go, this is my body, you know, I'm going to do with it what I want. You know, if it feels good, do it. You know, that kind of Nike kind of thing, just do it. And, you know, Jim was a man who realized that he'd been bought with a price. That Jesus had actually paid a price for him. And his ambition, his life, even though he had everything before him, he was good looking, he was a great speaker, he was a fantastic athlete. He had everything going for him with a successful career in the U.S. And he put it all aside because his driving ambition was not for his own glory because he was bought at a price and he was determined to live for Jesus. The blood of heaven flowed for us. Jesus has been faithful to provide for us, to redeem us, to heal us, to deliver us, even to die for us. And his last words on earth were to call us. And are we answering that call? Is our ambition to make disciples of all nations? Is that our driving ambition for glory to come to Jesus? Jim said, you make his ministers a flame of fire. Am I ignitable? And I want to ask you, are you ignitable? God, deliver me from the dead asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of the Spirit that I may be a flame. But flame is transient, often short-lived. Can you bear this, my soul, short life? Make me thy fuel, flame of God. I told you I did a lot of crying this afternoon. <laughs> I mean, we look at the life of that Olympian and, and we're inspired by that. But when we look at Jim's life, it's a whole nother level of inspiration because we understand that here is a man whose ambition is not for worldly glory his ambition is for the glory of heaven that a tribe that had never spoken praise in their language to God would speak the name of Jesus in their own language their heart language and that was his ambition that drove him there is no call by God that does not require faith we've all been given something from God to reveal who he is in this world 
I read something um, this morning in preparation for this morning. Um, God is a God of the impossible. Okay, so God is a God of the impossible. So that's the only way he's going to reveal himself. <laughs> he's not going to ask you to do mission possible, right? I remember <laughs> seeing that Mission Impossible film and, you know, he was complaining about hard, how hard it was going to be. And he said, Jim, this is not Mission Possible. This is Mission Impossible. No, not, this is not Mission Difficult. This is Mission Impossible. <laughs> and, and we have to understand that God is a God of the impossible. So he's never going to ask us to do something that is not supernatural because it won't reveal him. And so he's not going to ask you to do something that's going to be like easy peasy. You are going to have to have a driving ambition to see his glory in this world. So that the impossible will be revealed through you. And the Holy Spirit will do it through you. But your ambition must be to bring glory to Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit's job is to bring glory to Jesus. Maybe you can sing. Maybe you can build. Maybe you can give. Maybe you can serve. But are you ready to burn for him? The Bible says, whatever is given to you, do it. If you have the gift of faith, then live by faith. If you have the, the gift of giving, then give. You know, Whatever it is that we have in our life that we can do, we need to do it with an ambition for God. Can you say, God, my heart is a wick. Your love is the flame. I want to burn for your name. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. What was the difference between the first two and the third one? There was a difference in ambition. There was a difference in ambition. The first two had an ambition to please the master, to gain as much for their master as they could with what they had been given by the master. The other one hid it in the ground. You know, the one who sits on the pew and does nothing but get fat on the word. You know, we have to understand that there is a desire in God's heart for how us to have an ambition to please Him. This, this passage in Matthew is surrounded by parables. The virgins had to be ready. The sheep and the goats were judged by how they had loved Jesus by loving those here on earth. What does it look like to be ready to love no matter the cost, to be ready for the return of our King? A bag of gold is a talent 
We are given talents according to our abilities, right? We all have different abilities, different talents. Well, the talent was the heaviest unit of measure for gold, silver, and bronze in the time of Jesus. A talent was 6,000 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. So one of these bags of gold was 6,000 days wages. That was a huge gift. And, and what Jesus is saying here, even if you have one bag, like you're the, the least talent, you have 6,000 days wages of talent that I've given you. That's what Jesus is saying. Even you who think you are nothing, who think you are just the, the, the littlest of my servants, I've given you immense wealth. But what is your ambition to do with what I've given you? 6,000 days wages is about 20 years wages. Or about a million dollars. A lifetime's wage. What will we do with our life, our talent that God has given us? Jim Elliott was in his early 20s. He spent his youth preparing to go to Ecuador. He dedicated three plus years to reaching the Quicha, sorry, the Quicha, I don't even know how to pronounce that, people, so he could then reach the violent orcas. Quichua. <laughs> Dave will know because he's been to South America. <laughs> so, yeah, he spent three years learning about a tribe, not so he could reach that tribe, but so he could reach another tribe that this tribe was afraid of. The orcas, this was, the orca was a, a word from the Quichua that meant savage. And so he was reaching these Quichua because they could at least help him to reach the orcas who they called savage. While there, he married and had a child with his wife, Elizabeth. The orca were actually the Hurani people and Jim began to prepare to reach them. For three months, he flew over the tribe, delivering presents with a bucket. So they had a plane and they had a bucket attached to a rope. And they would fly over and drop presents with this bucket into the tribal group for three months. And so actually the tribe reciprocated and they put stuff into this bucket and they were able to pick it up. And so there was kind of this exchange of gifts going on. And Friday, January 6th, the three orcas uh, landed, sorry, on Friday, January 6th, they landed and built a tree house near the Orca village. And um, one of the Orcas came out and they took him for a ride in the plane. So they actually took him up in the plane and flew him around. So, you know, they're building relationship. It's looking good. They knew the dangers and their wives sent their husbands knowing they might become widows. Elizabeth wrote, they went simply because they knew they belonged to God. Because he was their creator and their redeemer. They had no choice but to willingly obey him. And that meant obeying his command to take the good news to every nation. You see, they were compelled by Christ's love. Not for, by anything else. The, 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 the compelling ambition in their life was the glory of Jesus. On Sunday, January 8th, so this is two days later, they were due to radio in at 4.30. There was silence. A plane was sent and then a rescue party and four of the bodies were recovered all speared. All five were martyred for the sake of Christ. All were married and four were fathers. One wife was pregnant. Her three-year-old was heard to tell the new crying baby, never mind when we get to heaven, I'll show you which one is daddy. Jim Elliot once said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot gain, sorry, gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'll say that again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim had seen through the consumerism of his culture. He had seen the emptiness of all this world offers. He had realized that for the greater value of the new creation God promises. He was ready to meet his creator. The potter's hands had formed his vessel well. One that fulfilled its purpose even in the shattered dreams of the wives and family left behind. These wives picked up where the five had left off and two years later baptized their husbands' killers in the very river where they had been killed. 
the whole tribe came to Christ. In the very river where these men were speared, their wives baptized their killers. Jim's last words recorded as he waited for the orcas to come, written in his journal. And I'll read them out to you in closing. I walked out to the hill just now. It is exalting, delicious to stand. Embraced by the shadow of a friendly tree, with the wind tugging at your coattail, and the heavens hailing your heart to gaze and glory and give oneself to God. What more could a man ask? Oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him. Perhaps in mercy he shall give me a host of children that I may lead them through the vast star fields to explore his delicacies, whose finger oh, whose finger end sets them to burning. But if not, if only I may see him touch his garments and smile into his eyes, oh then, not stars nor children shall matter, only himself. And then he went to his death. When our burning ambition is to see the glory of Jesus come to the nations, the nations will hear about Jesus. And the only reasons the nations do not hear about Jesus is because his disciples do not have a burning ambition for the glory of Jesus. Their burning ambition is for themselves, for their own glory, their own feathering of their own nest. And the church needs to wake up and realize we need an ambition for God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I thank you that you created in us a desire and hunger and ambition, Father, for your glory here on earth. That, Lord, we would desire to be used by you. That as your disciples, Father, we would really, truly, utterly desire to make disciples. That that would be our burning ambition. And whether we, we burn bright and short, or whether we burn long, Lord, that we will burn for you. And nothing else in this world. In Jesus' name.